invite you to take your Bible and turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, in just a minute, we'll begin reading in verse 14. And James 2, 14, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, my Thanksgiving was great. It was especially uh, sweet because I knew that this moment was coming. Uh, and we could stand here together, huddled around God's Word and read it and think on it together. And somewhere today in America at this moment, some pastor is preaching on uh, 97 reasons to be more grateful, or there's a pastor more progressive than me preaching on ecology now and how we need to protect the ozone layer and have your pet spayed and neutered. That's a great three-point sermon right there. Um, and that happens, and I'm being silly in these times. Of day, that happens around the world. But isn't it a great thing just to come around God's word and say to God, you can applaud for that. That's, uh, of all things, you can applaud for that. God's so good, that's directed toward him. Uh, because we can come to a passage like this, of all passages, James 2, that has uh, been talked about and is difficult and say, God, um, you know, we don't understand this. We don't. And we will not unless the Holy Spirit comes and reveals it to us. Isn't that amazing? And he promises to, and he does. He meets us here and reveals his word to us. It's just an unbelievable thought. What a sobering stewardship we have to hold uh, the word of God. And so let's read it together. James chapter 2. And let me begin reading in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Now, let's begin this morning with a review of what we talked about last week. In fact, before we get into that, let's go to God in prayer and ask for his favor on our time together. Father God, again, we just repeat that we're humble before your text, Lord. We don't have the power to know, understand, or act. But Father, you do. and You can grant us that. And so, Father, we can know, and we can understand, and we can respond. And so, Father, it's in that faith and confidence in you as revealed in your word, Lord, that we come to you this morning. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. James, as we've said before, is a book about really test. And because of that, the passage that we're looking at, James chapter 2 and verse 14, is not just significant because it's this tough, meaty, challenging theological text, although it is one of the toughest and most challenging ones in all of the Bible. But it's also compelling because really it's kind of the, the pinnacle, the, 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 the tempest. It's kind of where all the other tests come into one. The tests that are found in the book of James begin in chapter 1. The first is the test of trials. True faith can endure trials. And then there's the test of showing mercy in chapter 1 and chapter 2. True faith doesn't ignore the people who are in need of mercy, but it shows mercy. And then there's the test of the tongue, mentioned in chapter 1, but of course in chapter 3, where he says true, someone has true, genuine faith, it manifests itself in a controlled tongue. And so all of those tests kind of reach their, their pinnacle really right here in 2.14 through the end of the chapter when he sums it up by saying this, look, faith without works that accompany it is, is what? Is dead. Faith, you say you have faith, I have faith, but it doesn't have any works, is as alive as a body without breath, he's saying. 
It's there. It's a thing. You could say it exists, but it's just not, it's not alive. Faith without works is dead, he says. Now, I want you to imagine just a second a scenario with me, if you will. Imagine that someone is born during the time of Christ, and they're born into to first century Judaism. And what they're taught from the moment that they're a little child is that they're taught, look, here's the thing. If you want to go to heaven or if you want to have a relationship with God, the only way you can do that is by keeping this set of rules. Do this, do this, don't do this, really don't do that, and then you can go to heaven when you die. And that's not the bad part. <laughs> the bad part was is that the rules were impossible to achieve. And so they grew up under this, this weight this burden, this heaviness of trying to appease a God that they could never appease. It was just impossible. And so a big problem of what we'd call legalism. You can go to heaven by keeping the law. And then along comes that, this message of grace that Jesus brings. And it's a message of joy. And it's a message of freedom. And it's a message from liberty, from the the curse of the law. That really all it does is show us what a bad person we are because we really can't keep it. And all of a sudden someone grows up in that. And I don't know exactly why James is writing this. But maybe what's happening is someone grew up under this legalism. They hear the message of grace. But as the church grows and prospers and begins to uh, grow a little bit, some people grow up in the faith and say, yeah, we leave that legalism all together. In fact, we don't have to obey the law at all. I mean, as long as we pray a prayer, we're good, and we can just kind of do whatever we want to do after that. So the big problem initially was a problem of legalism, too much of the law. The big problem over here is what we call maybe a libertarianism. In other words, they just kind of did whatever they wanted to do. They thought they had faith, so, so they were fine. And maybe James is coming in and writing James chapter 2 to this group, this audience of people. And saying, if you have genuine faith, it will always manifest itself in works. And so writing that group, we asked a series of questions last week. What good is it, my brothers? The answer is, it's no good if you have a faith that doesn't have works. And then he says, the second question, can that type of faith save him? Not this genuine faith, this fake faith. Can that save him? The rhetorical question, the answer is no. If a brother or sister is in need of clothes and food and you say, God bless you, does that really fill them? Does that really warm them? And the answer, of course, is no. And the analogy is that's just as useless as your faith if it doesn't have any works. And this message is so challenging. It's so hard. It's so on the surface counter to many things that maybe you've been taught that maybe maybe you left last Sunday or you leave after reading this passage of Scripture uh, with some objections. We don't normally raise our hands on Sunday morning, but maybe you wanted to raise your hand and say, wait, wait a minute, but what about, what about this? And so James kind of senses that, perhaps, in his readers. He's anticipating that type of question. And it's been a joy this week to dialogue by some, uh, by email, and to talk to others in person to talk about what this means and its bearing and implications on us. And so sensing there might be an objection, here's what happens in verse 18. James kind of comes up with a hypothetical scenario where someone is an objector to what he's saying. Look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. James' response, that's the end of the quote. You have faith and I have works. Here's James' response. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Someone says, look, here's the deal. Some people go to heaven because they have faith. Other people go to heaven because they have works. In other words, this person was trying to take the scalpel of their own opinion and dissect and say, really, there's two groups of people, two groups of Christians, some who have faith and some have works, but really, in the end, they're just all kind of going to heaven. Now, I don't, I don't know if in all the Bible there is a verse that's more compelling for the church in America in this century. This is just, this is just the way we think. I almost think James writes that verse and then parenthetically it should say, hey, I'm looking at you, church in America. Because we say things like this. How many members are in your church? Oh, there's a thousand members. Well, that's great. How many do you have on Sunday morning? Oh, we have a hundred. 
but they're, they're all Christians, you see. And so we have these middle categories. There's two types of Christians. There's the kind that prays the prayer and just goes out in life and does whatever. Now, again, they don't love God. They don't have any passion for the things of God. They don't have any interest in telling people about Jesus. They don't have any interest in the word of God. They don't have spiritual conversations. And they don't want to come here. But there was that moment in 1992 at the Vacation Bible School. There's a card somewhere filled out. There's a baptismal certificate somewhere with their name on it. So they're fine. Those are kind of the faith people. And there's this other group of Christians that uh, they have also prayed to receive Christ, but they're actually working for the kingdom. They're faithful in things of God. They love the things of God. So really, Pastor, there are two groups of people that we call Christians. And James steps into this and says, a faith that does not work doesn't work. There There aren't two types of Christians. If someone has the Holy Spirit of Christ living inside of them, it manifests themselves in in works and behavior. And I know that what I've just said is disturbing because you have somebody like I have in my life who made some, quote, decision back in the past. But they're just, they're so far from God. Are you thinking of that person? I am right now. And right now, you're asking me a question that's perfectly logical. I just can't answer it. The question is, well, what what about my cousin? What about this person? What about this individual who had prayed to receive Christ, but at the same time, they're so far for God? Are are they a Christian? And the question, the answer to the question is, of course, I, I don't know. I don't know. But here's the more pressing reality. If someone is away from God, and they have no sense in turning back. They're happy what they're doing. Christianity is something that was behind them, not ahead of them. It's not a part of their life. They don't plan to be a part of their life in the future. It's not an issue of whether I can know they're a Christian or not. That's not really relevant. The question is that they can't really know. Because how can I be assured of genuine faith if I'm not working? Because the genuine faith always manifests itself in, in works. But back to our text the most important issue in this moment is not that person. It's not someone else. This was not written for all those other people. This was written for those of us in this room, myself included. So James writes and says, look, you're trying to create categories, some of faith and some of works. He says to that, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, the reason why this work is happening in my life, the reason why I have these things is not of myself. It's because the faith of God that I have in God is manifesting itself. The Holy Spirit is inside of me and what is put inside of me is, is working itself out. And so he says, I'm going to show you. Look at verse 18. This passage is all about proof and and evidence. I'm going to show you. And he makes two kind of, if I could summarize, two broad sweeping statements that are very, very important. Here's the, the first one. True faith is not knowledge alone. True faith is not knowledge alone. Here's his illustration. Here's how he tries to prove this. He says in verse 19, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now, what does that verse mean? Well, listen carefully. When he says you believe that God is one, this was a principal foundational tenet of Judaism. Racking against all the polytheistic nations, the one that worshiped many gods, they worshiped one God alone. And so it was their identity. And so at the core, he says, you have this foundational truth that God is one. You do well. We might today say, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again? Good. That's good. You do well. However, look at the rest of the verse. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again? Yes. Yes. Well, he says, even the demons believe that. They believe that, and not only that, they have the right reaction to it. They shudder. They tremble at the thought that one day Christ will have all authority over them. Now listen very carefully. The demons are orthodox in their theology. The demons are all conservatives. There's no liberals, at least theologically, in hell. 
Everyone in hell believes that every word of the scripture is right. They believe in the, the bodily resurrection of Christ, the virgin birth. They believe all of that. There's no question about that. The demons even believe that. But even though they believe that, clearly they're not Christians, right? Now again, it's such, it's such an appropriate verse to us because in our desire to make the word of God winsome and compelling in our evangelistic efforts as we're always going to do and try to lead people to faith, there is always the temptation to reduce salvation to a knowledge base. Do you deny that Jesus lived? No. Do you deny that he died and rose again? I don't deny that. Well, then you're a Christian. But not denying a foundational truth is different than saying, Jesus, I want to give all, I turn back my sin and I want to give all of my life to you. And it's perhaps James is hitting at a little bit of irony here. The demons believe, and oh, by the way, they have the right reaction. <laughs> they shudder at the thought. When many churches today are filled with people that have the right knowledge, but it just doesn't, it doesn't do anything for them. Doesn't affect them in any visceral way whatsoever. Could, could care less about it. So his point, and such an appropriate point for us, is that true faith is not knowledge alone. It's other things that are mentioned in this passage, repentance and faith and all these type things. It's not just assent to a body of facts. And then verse 20, before he makes his next point, he makes this really uh, interesting and kind of tough transition. Look at verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith, that faith apart from works is useless? Now, James is tough. He'll be a great guy to teach you theology, probably a horrible guy to go on a road trip with. He's kind of punchy and abrasive. And he says, look, I want to show you something. That thinking that you can kind of bifurcate and make two categories over these type and these type, that's foolish, he says. And I want to show you, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless. And by the way, you can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, there's a very clear play on words. The word works and the word useless sound very much the same in the Greek language. The word useless just means it does not work. So he says, I want to show you that faith that does not have works, well, that, that doesn't work. And so he's already told us this first thing, that true faith is more than just a knowledge base. But now he tells us what it is, moving from the negative to the positive. Here's the second big thing he wants to teach us, is that true faith has the evidence of action. The second big thing, true faith has the evidence of action. Here's his illustration, verse 21. Two illustrations of this truth, here's the first one. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. It's a, a brilliant strike really on the part of James to use Abraham as an illustration. Abraham, as you know, was the most significant figure in their faith. He was a patriarch, but more than that, he was the patriarch. No one more significant to a Jewish person in this context than Abraham. And he not only takes the life of Abraham, he refers to an event recorded in Genesis chapter 22 when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. This may be, and some argue, the greatest trial that anybody has endured in all the Bible. We know that God was against human sacrifice, and yet God was testing Abraham. Abraham passed the test because God said to him, I want to take your son and actually kill him on an altar. So he takes him up, and as they're walking, the way it's written in Genesis chapter 22 is this really compelling, really emotional kind of way. Or it says, take your son, your only son, Isaac. And as they're walking up, Isaac stops his dad and says, Dad, wait a minute, we have the wood and we're ready to make the fire, but where's the animal we're going to sacrifice? And Abraham just changes the subject. Well, God, God will provide the, the animal, son. Don't worry about that. Binds him, places him on the altar, raises the knife. And in that moment, God comes and intervenes through the means of an angel. Gives him actually an animal that's caught over there in the bushes and says, sacrifice the animal. I, I, you've just demonstrated to me, Abraham, that you have a genuine faith. 
So Abraham said he had faith, but the fact that he said he had faith was now justified in the fact that he acted a certain way that represented his, his true faith. And so that leads him to this summary statement. Look at verse 24. This is really, really compelling. And this is the verse that causes the most confusion. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. A person is justified by works. And if you've had the Bible in your lap for 5, 10, 20 years as a Christian, that verse should kind of strike a wrong chord. You should be thinking right now, Pastor, there's something wrong with that. That doesn't sound right. And the reason that doesn't sound right is because at some point you've heard or you've read the book of Romans. And so this is what causes this a lot of problems. So look at Romans chapter 3, and we're going to compare these two passages. It's the only other passage that we're going to turn to, but I ask that everyone do it. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 3. This year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. You know what that means. That uh, against the Roman Catholic Church, and at that time it's deep abuses from the Pope on down, uh, there were a group of people who protested uh, against it. And we stand in that tradition of Protestants. Uh, Principally there was a man by the name of Martin Luther who was an Augustinian monk who deeply, deeply believed in the church and gave his life for it. And yet, the more he tried to do the right things and to live the right way and to say the right things, he found himself frustrated. He just couldn't do it. And it was in reading this book, the book of Romans, that he stumbled across the profound truth of the grace of Christ. That no matter how much he tried, really he had favor in God's sight, not because of his effort. He had favor in God's sight because of God's overwhelming grace. There was nothing he could do to compel God to love him more or less. It was all given by God's grace. And that thought was so transformative in his life, it eventually led him to pen 95 theses against the church and pin them to the door at the Wittenberg Chapel and eventually be the spark that lit the Protestant Reformation and really changed the course of history. And Luther had, you may know this, a real problem with the book of James. In fact, he didn't like it so much, he didn't think it should be included in the Bible. He called it a book of straw, is what he called it. The reason why I call it a book of straw is because straw is good for lighting fires, for kindling. It's the kind of thing you should throw in the fire. Now, why did Luther feel that way? Well, because of Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Let's read it together. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And skip on down to verse 28. For we hold that the one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so Paul, again, writing against this legalism, is teaching that we're not justified by works, we're justified by faith. Now again, I don't want to be accused of skipping anything or glossing anything, so I want to show you this tension, and there is a tension, as clearly as possible. Romans 3, 28. For we hold that no, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now, let me read James 2, 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Do you see the problem? It's pretty obvious there, isn't it? I mean, it's just as clear as it can be that these two verses just should not be in the same Bible. How can we reconcile these two things? Well, this is so, so important. And so just let's give rapt attention to God's word for just a couple of minutes. Let me mention two things that help clarify it and really, I think, show that James and Paul are actually working together. They're actually uh, complement one another. You need to know that James is not reacting to Paul. James comes later chronologically in the Bible. However, the book of James was written before the book of Romans. So James isn't saying, despite what Paul teaches you, here's the truth. And that's not what's going on. Actually, James was written first. Neither is Paul reacting to James. That's not what's going on. What is going on? Well, two things we have to know. First of all, you have to know that they have different audiences. Remember we talked about the scenario where someone grew up under the law. They were told you had to keep the law. They were under the burden of this legalism. That's the audience to whom Paul is writing. Paul is writing to the extreme legalists and saying, no, you're not saved by keeping the law. You're saved by grace through faith. 
James, however, is writing this person that's way past that. They're over here on the libertarian side. They've forgotten the law. They think that if you just pray a prayer, you're fine. James is writing that group and saying, wait a minute. Have you, do you have real faith? Because if you have a real faith, once it's inside of you, it works itself out of you and it works. And so again, very important, on two extremes, two abusive extremes, Paul is writing to the extreme legalist, James is writing to the extreme libertarian, they have two different audiences. But the most important thing to understand about this passage is not the audiences, but it's their use of the word justified. Let's talk about how James uses it first. He talked about Abraham was justified. What did he mean by that? Well, here's the key word you need to think about. The way to think about this is through the word demonstration. Abraham said he had faith. He sacrificed. He prayed to God. But when he acted in such a way, he demonstrated that what he said was really true. I could say to you, you know what? I can run a mile in about five minutes. And if I made that statement, you would say, I'm out of the parking lot and say, okay, pastor, let's prove it. And when I came back 10 to 12 minutes later, you would say, you know, your claim is not justified. I wasn't justified. So when James used the word justified, he means that as evidence, as proof, as demonstration. This is the idea. Paul, however, is using it in a very different way. Paul is using it not in the sense of demonstration, but in the sense of declaration. Look at verse 26 in Romans chapter 3, if you're still there. Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. So when we come and put our faith in Jesus... What happens is, at that moment, not based upon what we've done, not based upon how good we are or right we are, but based on the fact that God is so pleased with the sacrifice of His Son, God looks down at all the sins we've ever committed, all the sins that we ever commit, and He says, you are absolutely and wholly forgiven. The technical theological word is justification. One day when you stand before me, all of your sins will be forgotten. They'll be erased. They'll be gone because you are justified. You are made right. God declares that at the moment of salvation. It's the technical word forensic. In other words, in a legal standing, he's saying you are no longer held guilty for all your sins. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That's justification as God's declaration. The sequence is really important. First, God declares me righteous, declaration, in that way I'm justified. But I know that I have that faith because that declaration of faith, of justification, is followed by a demonstration of it later. So, Paul is here saying, when he uses the word justified, I'm talking about God's declaration, not of you, all of him coming from God, God's declaration that you are righteous. When James used the word justified, he's talking about something that comes later, the demonstration of that righteousness that comes as an effect. So the cause, God's declaration, the effect, our demonstration. So to make this clear, James is writing in this moment and saying, hey, wait a minute, is there a demonstration? And someone says, yeah, well, not, not really. And James says, okay, if there's no demonstration, was there ever a declaration over here? You see, these are, these are linked. And so you don't work backwards. You don't say, I work to make myself a Christian. No, no, no. What you say is, you know what, if I have truly been in Christ, it manifests itself in all the things that we would call the fruit of the Spirit. And if that is not there, James steps in and says, you know what, do you have a real faith? How is your faith working, is what he says. By the way, as an aside, this is how we know we're going to heaven. The theological terms are justification, what God declares, this process of demonstration, the technical word is sanctification, making me holy, pulling me into himself, that ultimately leads in glorification, going to heaven. But all these things are linked. You see, they're linked. And this is James's point. If God has declared you righteous, if you've really been saved, it is linked to the demonstration of it. It's going to work itself out in works. It just, it just will. The two are inseparable. And ultimately, this justification will lead us all the way to heaven. It's all, it's all together. It's one, one thing. So that's his first illustration of the truth, that true faith 
has the evidence of action. Here's his second illustration. Go back to James chapter 2. And look at verse 25. Here's a second illustration. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified when by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. This is a great illustration. He's just used the illustration of the greatest patriarch in their faith, Abraham. And he used another illustration of Rahab. Now, why Rahab? Would well, you remember the story of Rahab? It's recorded in Joshua chapter 2. Here's the story. God told the children of Israel, you're going to go in and take this land that I've always promised for you. But in order to go in and take that land, there were enemies there. They had to go in and spy it out. So they sent two spies, very dangerous. They could get caught. They could get killed. And the whole mission would be aborted. And so it was very important what they were doing. When they got in there, they found favor with an innkeeper. She may have been a prostitute, but definitely an innkeeper uh, by the name of Rahab. And she hid them. And she was really nice to them. She even lied to the authorities. And so they said, now why are you doing this for us? You're not one of us. And she said, well, because I know. I believe. I believe that your God is the real God. I believe he's actually going to take over. We're scared to death. We know you're coming for us. I just believe. But then she acted on that belief by actually risking her life for them. And by the way, just as a side, she was spared when they actually did come into Canaan. She's actually mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 as the great people of faith. She's mentioned other people in Scripture, other places in Scripture as a great hero of the faith. Because not only did she say it, but her words were justified by the action of risking her own life. And so James writes and says, hey, look, I'm going to give you two illustrations. One a patriarch and one a prostitute. It's James' way of saying, hey, look, do you have great prominence? Well... If you don't have works, your faith is dead. Oh, by the way, are you on the other end of the spectrum? Are you a person of ill repute with a horrible reputation that nobody cares about or nobody knows their name? Well, you too have to have a faith that works. And any, anyone in the middle, does your faith work? So a summary statement to all of this would be found in verse 26. Look at how he sums it up. He repeats verse 17. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Listen to what John Calvin said, another reformer. Here's what he said. This is good. He said, we are saved by faith alone. But we are saved by a faith that is never alone. We are saved by faith alone, but we are saved by a faith that is never alone. In other words, we're saved by faith alone, but true faith is always accompanied by works. James emphasized this several times when he says faith in verse 17 by itself. Faith, verse 18, apart from works. A faith that is alone without works that accompany it is a dead faith. Even though Luther did not like the book of James... Listen to what he said. Somebody sent me this this week. It's very good. This is a quote by Luther. Faith is a divine work in us which changes us and makes us to be born anew of God. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. This knowledge of and confidence in God's grace makes men glad and bold and happy in dealing with God and all creatures. Listen to this. And this is the work which the Holy Spirit performed in faith. Because of it, without compulsion, a person is ready and glad to do good to everyone, to serve everyone, to suffer everything out of love and praise to God who has shown him this grace. Thus it is impossible to separate works from faith, quite as impossible as to separate heat and light from fire. It's a good illustration, isn't it? Someone says, I have faith, but it changes nothing about my life. To which Luther says, yeah, that's like having a fire, but saying it doesn't produce heat or light. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. A cause, like a fire, has an effect, heat and light. A cause, like faith, has an effect, it works. I was thinking about this this week, and let me just say two summary statements in conclusion. I think help clarify, and it's been a joy this week, the dialogue, some by email, and private conversations with some people about these things and 
just in reflection, let me mention two things that I hope are clarify. Now, the first one is this. We have to understand James is not setting up a contrast between two ways to come to God. Some people are going to come by faith. Some people are going to come by works. In fact, listen to what Douglas Moo, one commentator, said. This is really helpful. James is not really contrasting faith and works as if these were two alternative options and one's approach to God. He is rather contrasting a faith that because it is inherently defective produces no works and a faith because it is genuine does result in action. And this is why we used last week the illustration of the watch. Imagine if you had a watch that was supposed to cost thousands of dollars, but it didn't because actually it was a fake. And if you have a fake watch, what it's going to do is it's going to break. It's going to not keep time. It's going to do all those things. And if you want to fix the problem of having a fake watch, you don't duct tape it. Right? You don't say, I'm not sure if this is real. Let me glue it. Now what you do is you take it to a jeweler, someone who's an expert in this, and say, hey, look, just, just tell me, I don't really know. Is this fake or is this real? And James is being that friend to us. He, he's coming to us and he's saying, look, I, I'm not telling you you need to upgrade in a different category of faith. He's saying, are you, is what you really have really real? Do you have a real faith or do you have a fake faith? Because, James reminds us, a workless faith is a worthless faith. Do you have a real faith? And the second thing, and this is so important. James is not telling us to work. He's not saying, hey, by the way, faith has works, so come on, man. Get with it. Let's go. It's not, it's not what he's saying. This is, not a, this is not a compulsion to, to add more effort to it. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, as natural, to use Jesus' illustration, as a tree that produces fruit, a tree doesn't try to be a specific type of tree. It just is. And how do we know what type of tree it is? By the fruit. But the fruit didn't make that tree that type of tree. Apples don't make an apple tree uh, an apple tree. It just is an apple tree, therefore it produces that fruit. It's not trying to, it just does that. So he's not saying, hey, you have the faith, now work harder. What he's saying is, if you have a real faith, it's going to produce fruit. The Holy Spirit is inside of us, Galatians 5, and it produces that fruit. So last year, or earlier this spring, rather, my son's uh, preschool teacher told me, um, I do not like having your son in class. And... Uh, I thought I was being baited, so I just went along with it and said, okay, well, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, why don't you like having him in class? And she said, because he looks too much like you, and I feel like I'm teaching my pastor. <laughs> so I understand that, teach your pastor how to glue and color and these type of things. That would be awkward, I guess. Um, I don't like that. And the only thing I think of was, you know <laughs> He just, he can't do anything about it. So sorry, <laughs> so sorry for him, so sorry for you, for everyone involved in this. Uh, he just, he can't do it. His appearance and his actions are genetically given to him. He's not trying to be like me. I've never sat him down and said, no, you walk like this and use this vocal inflection. I've never done that. He just, he just does it. He can't not do it. Because physically, he was given a genetic disposition that determines his appearance and actions in the same way that spiritually, we're given a genetic disposition that determines our appearance and our actions. Children who are children of God act like their father. Which is why Jesus would say, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He's not saying, hey, y'all better be holy. He's saying, are you my child? Because God's children act like their father. It's just natural, or rather it's, it's supernatural. In the same way that our children act like us, we act like our father who's in heaven. So, true faith has the evidence of action. That's it. It doesn't make us a Christian. It's the proof. It's the evidence of what we say is really true. It has the evidence of action. So, your faith and my faith, here's the question, how how is it working? Father God, we are grateful for your love for us, Father. God, we thank you for this, 
this singular moment, Father, this is a moment of decision and some are going to cross a line they've never thought they even needed to. There's some here, Lord, that thought they could rock along with a cultural Christianity. No one ever bothered them, touched them, and along comes James and asks us, do we have a fake faith? Who calls us out from this lie of a Christianity that doesn't change the life. Father God, I pray that as a people, as individuals, and Lord, as a church, you'd rescue us from that, Father. Father God, we love you. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. With heads bowed, eyes are closed. We are here to facilitate anything that God's doing in your life. Join the church. Want to pray with somebody, whatever it is. We're People are here at the front. There's an altar here. This is just a moment to do that. Whatever way you want to come, got questions, just come. Take one of these men by the hand and talk about what it means to have a relationship with God. But very specifically right now, to the point of the text, there are some who right now are looking inside. You're not praying about someone else. You're not thinking about someone else. You're looking inside and you're asking this question, do I have a real faith? And the answer may be, I don't know. There's a question there. And on the authority of God's word, there doesn't have to be. There can be certainty. There can be peace. Peace. And right now you might be thinking, well, I don't know, Uh, I'm I'm confused, I need to talk with somebody. That's what this is about. We want to talk through what it means to have a relationship with Christ. If you have doubt, you have any question in your mind that you're seeing genuine fruit in your life, come and let's, let's talk about this. Let's pray this through. Whatever reason you want to come and step out and just come, you just do so even in this moment. And I I beg of you with everything that's within me, if there's one question that you have of faith that's fake, don't leave here with that question in your mind. Get it settled. Deal with it right now. This is your moment. Father God, we love you. And Lord, we ask in your Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would move in this place. Lord, give us clarity as we respond to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.